Football is here. The Titans kicked off the preseason Saturday night with a win 20 to 16 over the Packers. College football also just around the corner. Tennessee Vanderbilt already in fall camps. The doors whittling down their quarterback competition from six to three. Steven Rivers, Jonathan McCrary, Pat and Robinette all battling it out there. It'd be very interesting who Derek Mason sides with in that battle as they move closer to their opening game against Temple on August the 28th. Middle Tennessee unveiled their new jerseys yesterday. TSU looking to get back to the playoffs in back-to-back -back years after not going since 1999. And there is a great book out that can get you ready for the opening kickoff of the season. The book is called the opening kickoff. It's by Big Ten Network's main anchor, Dave Revson. The opening kickoff, the tumultuous birth of a football nation. It has some great stories in here about sort of the forgotten years of college football. Way back in the late 1800s, early part of the 1900s. Uh, stories about the, the safety of the game and all sorts of things like that that is just really interesting and surprisingly parallel to a lot of the discussions going on today in college football in terms of paying players, extra benefits for athletes, amateurism, safety, what the sport really looks like regionally and around the country between various schools. A lot of questions like that, and, and I think you're surprised when you think about how big business college football is today the really big business goes back a long way in college football way back to the 1800s and not all that long after the initial birth of college football so we hope to get Dave Revson on the phone to talk about this book because it's really interesting read I highly recommend it if you like history if you like college football especially if you like both I think it is a fascinating fascinating read good one to get started for the college football season waiting to get dave on the phone hopefully we can do that here at some point but until then we'll get back to a little titans talk from the weekend a 20 to 16 win over the packers in what was a monsoon out there the star of the game jackie battle or at least one of the stars of the game he had the game-winning touchdown on that final drive. We caught up with Jackie Battle in the locker room right after the game. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it was big for me because this is my first time playing fullback in a live game situation. So um, there's going to be a lot of a lot of good film for me to watch. You had that one ball bounce off your shoulder. Is that one you want back? I definitely want that one back, man. That one, it, it snuck up on me. I mean, it was a little damp, but that's not an excuse. But uh, yeah, I definitely want that one back. How do you feel about that transition to fullback? Are you starting to feel comfortable? Um, a little bit. I mean, the, the, the more reps I get, the more games I play, the more comfortable I'm going to get. And, you know, this is just my first live game playing fullback. But I'm gradually getting more comfortable with the position. You got a lot of running backs to block for. Is that fun to have so many weapons behind you? Yeah, man. I, I, they, they were running hard, man. I'm, I'm excited about this whole, this our backfield, man. You know, um, all of them are, are talented in their own ways. They, they all bring different things to the table. I think we're going to be exciting offense to watch. You were out there with a the rookie quarterback, Zach Meckenberger. Is, are you able to be a veteran presence on the field with him in his first snaps in the NFL? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, the thing about it is he was pretty composed for a guy that's, you know, his first live action. Um, he did a great job. Like I said, that two-minute drill, he commanded the offense. So um, he did a great job, man. He commanded the offense. <laughs> Brought us down there for a scoring drive, so he's he, he he did a good job today. What needs to happen before your road game next week? Like I said, man, we got a lot. We have, there's a lot of things we have to improve on. We made a lot of mental errors that we have to clean up. Jack, congrats, thing. No Jackie, problem. What you mean to uh, get in the end zone? A preseason game, but a game-winning score nonetheless. Well, I, I had to make up for a drop that <laughs> that uh, turned into an interception, but you know, if, it, if, it felt good to get back in there. Anytime you have the opportunity to get your hands on the ball, especially now moving to fullback, you got to make the most of it, don't you? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it kind of caught me off guard. I didn't know I was going to be playing some tailback today, so um, they threw me in there to the, at, the, at the end for uh, for the two-minute drill, and I got a few carries. I got a, a catch earlier in the game, so um, there's some opportunities for me to carry the ball this year, I think. Uh, the versatility, we've talked about that before, but the fact that you can get in there, go nose-to-nose -nose and block for some guys, you can carry the ball, you can catch the ball, hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> 
what does that mean to, to your chances on this team and what you can add to this team? Well, it just it just adds more value. I mean, it shows versatility. And I just said I was playing on all the special teams. And uh, even on special teams, I'm a guy you can move around and put in different spots. Mm -hmm. So just the fact that I'm able to do a bunch of things, I think it adds a lot of value to me. Kind of a slow start offensively. How much did the conditions play into that time? You know, I think the conditions did play a, a small role, but you're going to have to play in weather like that. You still have to overcome those things. And you guys did that tonight. Again, it's a preseason game, but what does the W mean? It means a lot. I mean, it, it definitely boosts our confidence a little bit. But like I said, I mean, there's a lot of a lot of mental errors that we made today. There's a lot of room for improvement. I mean, we came out with a W, but there's, a, there's still a lot of room for improvement. Three touchdowns all coming from the running back room. What does that say about the type of attack this rushing game can be? I think we're going to be dangerous. I think we're going to be real dangerous. I mean, we got we got guys that can do everything. You got we got we got Sean being a power guy. Dex can you know quick as lightning, and Bishop's just really well rounded. So, I mean, I think the rush attack's going to be really dangerous. Thanks, Jack. Jackie Battle after the game Saturday night. Of course, he had the game-winning touchdown in the fourth quarter to give the Titans that 20-16 to win over the Packers. The guy who really led that drive, though, was the quarterback, Zach Mettenberger, rookie, sixth-round pick. Got off to an inauspicious start in that game with a fumble and an interception in his first couple drives, but he made amends leading the Titans down the field on that game-winning drive. Here's Mettenberger, okay with the win, but not all that happy with his performance. Was, was the ball still wet when you were in there? Or was, was yeah. Was it pretty good at that point? Yeah, I think everything was soaked. I used a freaking dish rag at the end there because we ran out of towels. But, uh, you know, you, you just got to handle it uh, and be weatherproof. It's a preseason game, but you guys are down. And, and you take the ball deep in your territory and go the length of the field. Oh, what's a drive like that mean for you guys right now? Um... You know, that's, that's really what we need to do. That's how you got to respond, uh, you know, especially in a you know, close game after, uh, you know, two really unfortunate drives. But, uh, you know, we really responded well and we're, we're able to go down and get a touchdown. What, uh, how frustrating were the, the first couple drives and the way they ended? You? Definitely not the way I wanted to start my NFL career, but, uh, you know, it can only get better from here, I hope. Well, you, you go out and you get those two big strikes and then Jackie punches in the end zone. A little bit of redemption maybe? Uh, not really. Uh, you know, I'd like to go back and hold on to the ball and, um, you know, have Jackie holding the ball. Maybe we have, you know, two more touchdowns on the board there. But, uh, you know, all things considering, we got the win, and that's the most important thing. Sloppy conditions tonight, but in terms of just seeing the field and kind of understanding what was going on, how would you feel the first time out there? Uh, it felt great. Uh, you know, honestly, this was, um, you know, obviously was, was more important in practice, but, you know, this is why we practice. This is the scenarios we practice, and uh, you know, I feel like I've been doing well there. And uh, you know, I just had to have translate it to, to a game scenario, and uh, was able to capitalize on the big moment at the end. First time with live bullets ar around your knee since obviously the game where you hurt it last year. Any concerns about that, or at least was it confidence boost to be out there with people flying around you and play the way you did? Yeah, um, yeah. Me and Jake were talking about it. You know, for the game, uh, both of us haven't played since our injuries last year, and uh, you know, we were just. Ready to get out there and, and take a hit, uh, you know, just get that feeling going. And uh, you know, once I got some contact, had some people around my feet, uh, you know, made a, you know a few movements in the pocket and scrambled. Uh, I felt really, really comfortable with it. And uh, you know, now I just need to continue rehab and uh, just get better. What are you eager to get back and work on after this? Um, you know, obviously not turning the ball over. Um, you know, and just continue to develop, you know, my understanding of the offense and, uh, you know, just the, the intricate details that, that Coach Woods' offense has. As you know, though, sometimes, especially after playing in the SEC, sometimes it's not always pretty offensively, but a win is a win. Do, do you still feel that way even in the preseason? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, ugly win is way better than a, than a pretty loss. And, uh, you know, that's that's kind of the situation we had today. And, um, you know, now we just got to, you know, build off this and get ready for next week. Thanks, Zach. Definitely an ugly win for the Titans in the preseason opener on Saturday night. Zach Mettenberger going four of seven, leading that game-winning drive in the fourth quarter. As we mentioned, great book out right now about college football. The opening kickoff, terrific read to get to before the start of the season. It really kind of sets you back in the history of the game. And as we mentioned, there's a lot of parallels in this book that match up with what's going on right now today in 2014 in college football. The author of the opening kickoff, the tumultuous birth of a football nation, 
is Big Ten Network studio host Dave Revson. Dave is on the phone with us. Dave, good evening. How are you, my friend? I am great, Steve. How are you? I am doing wonderful. This book, I got it, I, I think, about 10 days ago, and it took me all of about three days to read it cover to cover. It is a fascinating book for anybody who's a college football fan or a historian or, or interested in history. What gave you the idea to go back and, and research and write the story of college football the early days? Well, I kind of stumbled upon this story, Steve, as you probably ascertained in reading the book about this guy, Pat O'Day, who played at Wisconsin, who, as you know, had this really, he was a great player, was one of the first great players kind of west of the Alleghenies, one of the first All-Americans in that region of the country, and then had this bizarre life, a life that kind of spun out of control and had a, a real mystery that surrounded it. And so I was very intrigued by him, and I actually kind of started in on him and thought maybe I would write his life story. But then as I read about him and kind of, you know, whenever you're writing someone's story, you still need to contextualize with what was going on around him. And it just became apparent to me that the much bigger story, as interesting as I thought he was, the much bigger story was the time period and the amazing kind of uncanny similarities to what was happening, uh, of what was happening then to what's happening now. And so I kind of used him, as, he, as you know, as a mechanism to take us through the story and give it a bit of a narrative frame. But really the story is about the early days of, of college football and kind of how we got to where we are because it's such an odd marriage of these major academic institutions and this huge enterprise of college football. We're the only civilization in the world that does it. Why do we do it this way? This book kind of explains it. Yeah, it's crazy when you think now and all the talk about the Power Five getting autonomy and what that means for college football and big business and uh, benefits for players and safety in the game of football. All of that existed back in 1895 too, didn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this name, image, and likeness stuff, it's so funny. We were just we're doing our Big Ten bus tour. We were just in Ann Arbor, and I was talking to someone there about Willie Heston cigars. I don't know if you remember that from the book, but <laughs> Willie Heston was a, a great player at Michigan in the early 1900s, and he had a cigar named after him on campus, and he got a, a cut of the, of the cigar sales. There was a guy at Yale named James Hogan. It was the same idea. He had a deal with the American Tobacco Company. And they sold cigarettes on campus that he endorsed, and he got a, a cut of the endorsement. So none of these concepts are new. I mean, we look at the O'Bannon case and we say, well, it's uncharted territory. It's really not. I mean, the way that it's been handled and the legislation is new, but the concepts, the idea that, that college football players could make money off their likeness, the idea that we'd have a huge injury crisis, as you know, the game was nearly banned uh, in 1905, and, and President Roosevelt kind of had to intervene to help save it. There were huge academic scandals, as you know, recruiting scandals, all of these things. None of this is new, but also the pageantry. None of that's new either, and that was the thing that really struck me. I mean, to think there's a game in 1893 in New York City between Yale and Princeton, there are 50,000 people at the game, and the New York Sun sent 17 reporters. <laughs> but I would have never guessed that in a million years. I always thought this was just kind of a a small time thing but it was big business even then that's where the story starts in the opening kickoff is with that thanksgiving thanksgiving day game back in 1893 between princeton and yale as you mentioned you're right the picture you paint of 50,000 people the grandstands completely f full people standing room only then going up on the bluff in the hillside above the stadium can you put that into context? I mean, 50,000 today, people maybe kind of scoff at compared to some of the great coliseums out there. Right. But can you put that into context in, in just how big of a deal that was back then? Well, I'm going to give credit where credit is due here. I was on Keith Olbermann's show last week, and Keith brought up the point. He is, as you know, quite a baseball historian. He said that was at least twice as many people as had ever been in a Major League Baseball game at that point. So that gives you a sense of what a big deal was. I didn't know that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a, you know, when you think about that, there were no big stadiums at the time. I mean, as you say, they were, people were hanging off the, what is Coogan's Bluff, it was uh, referred to when it was the Polo Grounds. It was the same uh, setting as the Polo Grounds later. Uh, I mean, people on this viaduct that overlooked it, they had basically anywhere you could put people, rooftops. I mean, it really was remarkable. There were as many people there as you could possibly fit in. The whole city was shut down. The, the subway or the elevated train uh, had 
people literally hanging off the edges. The conductors were fearing people were going to fall out. I mean, it's really remarkable how the, the city was, was enraptured by this football game. And again, I just would have never guessed that, Steve. And, and as you say, that kind of sets the tone for it. Now, in the smaller places that are hard to get to, look, travel was tough in that time. Obviously, there are no cars. Long-distance rail travel was a challenge. So, you know, I talk a lot about games in the Midwest at Wisconsin or Michigan. Those games maybe had 10,000 people, but that was still considered to be an enormous group of people in that time period. So, yeah, it was a big, big deal. And, and I, the newspapers were so flowery in their language and so evocative that it, it did make it easy to try to convey what a big deal it was because it, it was incredible. Well, yeah, one of the big games you talked about was the Wisconsin-Minnesota game a couple years after that first game, and they, Wisconsin went over to Minneapolis. I think there were 6,000 people there, but 1,000 people made the trip, and they basically escorted them from campus to the train depot all the way to Minneapolis and back for that big game. Yeah, that one was huge. Then uh, there was a big game, as you know, kind of the culmination of O'Day's career going out to play Yale. Uh, in 1899, they left at something like before 5 o'clock in the morning, and there were hundreds of people at the train depot. And, I mean, think about this. Like, they, they could barely, you know, you had to, like, bring candles to find your way around town. I mean, it's not like there's streetlights or anything. I mean, it's just, it, it, it's a whole different world. And you think about how passionate these people were about this team to show up at, at 445 in the morning at a train depot to show them off for what was a 40-hour trip out to New Haven to take on Yale. It is. I mean, it really blew me away how, you know, we look at it again today and we say, you know, where you are, that, you know, the, the uh, passion that surrounds Tennessee or Vanderbilt, and we say, well, this is, you, you can't describe this passion. You can't, there's no parallel to this passion. Well, I would argue that on a relative scale, they were just as passionate then. The sheer numbers might not have been the same, because there were fewer people to, to root for these teams. But in terms of the percentage of people who showed up, I mean, it's remarkable how into it people were. Who was the guy who was in his hospital bed, and when he found out his team was losing, he, he jumped out, threw on his cleats, and then went and played, like, the final drive of the game to win it? Right. Well, that was the uh, the Frank Merrill uh, story, which, of course, was, uh, you know, a, a fictional account. But, but you, you read that, and you believe it could happen, right? right? Uh, yeah. Frank Merrill was a, a great player. Uh, a, a great story, I should say. A uh, guy, a fictional uh, character who played at Yale, and these books sold like seven million copies a year. I mean, the, the claim is that they sold more Frank Merriwell books than Bibles. So, I mean, you get a sense again. It shows you that if uh, an author chose a college football player to be his mechanism for reaching that, that those magazines were meant for young people kind of get them into reading if he chose a Yale football player as the person to get young people into reading it tells you what a big deal college football was and and yeah the, that whole the, the Frank Merrill thing kind of blew my mind and you want to think of a parallel it's interesting I was talking to Charles Davis about this and Charles was saying he had been telling people for years that Tim Tebow was the modern day Frank Merrill and everyone looked at him and said what in the world are you talking about? But he is, right? I mean, yeah. life w w without vice, right? The, the, the virtuous, upstanding citizen and surrounded by a, a, a world of, of no good people. I mean, you know, the parallels are, are really pretty shocking. And if that's the case, is Johnny Manziel the present day Pat O'Day? <laughs> he might be, right? <laughs> I mean, it's funny. I, I would agree with that assertion to a certain extent. I mean, Again, everything is relative, and I think one of the things that I make a point of in this book is you have to understand scope and scale, that obviously Pat O'Day was not followed in the same way that Johnny Manziel is because there was no Twitter, there was no radio, there was no television. But relative to the day, he was followed as closely as you could be followed. There were articles about his relationships, right, with the, the opera singer, Dame Nellie Melba. Yep. Everywhere that he went, there were reporters following him, marveling at his skills. They talked about him as, as being a transcendent figure who brought not just prominence to uh, the university's football team, but to the university itself. I mean, all of those things really are so reminiscent of a guy like Johnny Manziel. Some of the Merriwell stories are almost less fantastic than the O'Day stories, and they were the fictional ones. So that tells you all you need to know about Pat O'Day. Dave Revson's with us. He is the author of the opening kickoff. Dave, there, there are so many parallels 
to back then and now what we're talking about today in college football what do you think this maybe tells fans about what's ahead because there is a lot of uncertainty about the present day college football do you take anything from how they handled these issues in the past to what we're about to face now well i hate to say this but i think in one in a certain sense it almost lets our generation off the hook a little bit i think there are some people steve who say man this thing has just gotten so out of control and how have we let it get to this point and one of the points i try to make in the book is well it was always at this point it was always a little bit out of control it's always been as i said at the beginning a little bit of an odd marriage as to what it tells us going forward i mean i will say this i I think there is a lot of unpredictability in college football and just because the present mirrors the past doesn't necessarily mean we know exactly where we're going i mean i think this was a monumental week uh, with the O'Bannon decision and with the autonomy. And I think people would be fooling you if they said they know exactly where this is going or exactly what college football is going to look like in 20 or 30 years. But I would say that what the past does teach us is that these are normal things to be, that the, the things that we're struggling with are things people have been struggling with for a long time and that there are no easy answers to these questions. And I'm not convinced that the O'Bannon decision or that the autonomy, I don't think those questions have ended. They've just reached a temporary resolution, and we'll see where they go now 5, 10, 30, 40 years down the line. Before I let you go, Dave, I know you've been busy the last couple weeks on the Big Ten Network bus tour around the now 14 campuses in the Big Ten. I got to ask you about James Franklin at Penn State. How has he been received, and what is the anticipation like for his first game in Happy Valley? Well, it's great. I mean, they really do like him a lot there, and I know uh, people in Nashville marveled at what he did with Vanderbilt. He really did do a good job. It's a very likable staff, as you know, and, and he brought a lot of those guys with him. Um, they're excited. I, I think that the truth of the matter is they have some really serious depth concerns at, at important positions, Steve. I'd be very surprised if they have a good year this year, but he's recruited extremely well, and it appears that they are in position to, a couple of years down the line, really challenge Ohio State and Michigan State. And You know that at some point Michigan's going to be back up there as well. But that's going to be a really loaded division with James Franklin at Penn State as well. Can anybody challenge the Buckeyes this year? Yeah, I think so. We're in East Lansing right now. We're going to see Michigan State tomorrow. And I would just say solely based on who's coming back, where the question marks are, and the schedule, which has Michigan State hosting Ohio State, I kind of came into this thinking I had Michigan State by a nose ahead of Ohio State. I'm anxious to see the Spartans tomorrow. And there's also this issue, and we're going to talk about this with Mark Antonio, of the difference between being the team that is doing the chasing and the team that's being chased. You know, when you have that target on your back, how will you react? And I think that's going to be the challenge for Antonio, and I'm anxious to see kind of the the culture that he's created in this preseason camp. But I would lean towards Michigan State right now, although Ohio State was, was very impressive when we were there, no doubt. The Spartans were one of the hottest teams in the country down the stretch last year. Even Mark D'Antonio said, hey, we would have loved to have the college football playoff last year because we thought we had a great chance to win it. The opening kickoff is the book, The Tumultuous Birth of a Football Nation. Dave, last I knew one of the major online retailers was sold out. Have you corrected that? I guess that's a good and a bad problem to have for an author. <laughs> it was. It was nice to know that there was that demand for it. It was pretty cool, actually. But it did. Uh, it did, in fact, uh, we'll just say it, it was Amazon, and they now have the books back. So you can get books on Amazon or anywhere that, that you buy books, uh, everywhere that's supposed to have them has them. So it, it's, uh, it's been pretty cool, Steve. The reception's been really gratifying, and I'm thrilled that you liked it, and I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to talk about it. Absolutely. I, I loved it. It's always great to talk football or, or anything with you. So I appreciate you coming on the program tonight, and have fun up there in Big Ten country this fall. Super. Thanks a lot, Steve. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Dave Revson, good guy, good host up there at the Big Ten Network. Lots to talk about. If, if you can, check them out on your local cable company, your satellite provider, because they do really good work up there around Big Ten athletics. The SEC Network going to be very similar down here when it launches in just a few days. But a great book. And like I said, if you are a college football fan, there's a lot of fun stories in here that do paint the picture of what college football was 
back before sort of the BCS era and all, all the things that we know today in college football. we got to take a break. We will come back, get to more talk about the Titans from over the weekend against the Packers, and we can get back to your phone calls as well. 737-7767 is the number. Stay tuned. You're watching Sports Live.